Uh, welcome to this last session of today. We have two more very interesting um, performers, researchers here with us today. We will start with um, Sylvia Lucas. She is from the Royal Norton College of Music and she will guide us through different ways of notating electronics in piano music. I'll try. <laughs> Um, this lecture recital is rather a recital lecture, so I'm going to play two different pieces and then I'm going to talk a little bit about them. So I will start with Luigi Nono, so for the Onda Serene.
going to be playing a piece commissioned for my research. It's called Who Could Get a Dog by John Oren, composer from the UK. <coughs> If I had a dog, I would call that dog Shoelace. Sylvia, follow my instructions as we go. Okay, see you to call now. I don't know why I'd call the dog Shoelace over other names I could choose, such as light bulb, or deck chair, or picture frame folded postcard or even even cardboard box no i would sylvia maintain the pulse moving to an f sharp half diminished seven one two three four now i would call the dog shoelace because same again sylvia this time to f seven one two three four now because i think shoelace is a good name for a dog Okay, Sylvia, let's shake these up a bit. Head to F major now. I imagine Shoelace is a basset hound. I don't know why, I just always have. Perhaps it's the way that basset hounds look that appeals to me. Sylvia, take it down a semitone. Okay, what to now? Always sad, as if they've just received bad news. Sylvia, same again. What two, three, now. With those ears that droop down and drag along the floor. What two, three, four, stop. But there seems to be a sort of wisdom with a basset hound that conjures up images of detectives and partners in crime. Shoelace and I would be partners in crime. Sylvia, with each mention of shoelace, switch between D6 and D6. Okay. And when shoelace gets into shenanigans, I'd help shoelace out. And in return, shoelace would help me out. In shoelace's own shoelace kind of way. Bell time eat clap now. On our off days, we'd go to the park together. The walks. Take it to a finer Sylvia. What to now? And if shoelace straight too far ahead, or if maybe Sylvia moved to E flat major, what two three now? Maybe shoelace got lost. Sylvia, stop. With differing major and minor triads in each hand, follow the syllables of my words. Use your imagination. Okay. If shoelace got lost, I just shoelace. Where have you gone, Shoelace? Shoelace. I can't seem to find you, Shoelace. Can you hear me? Shoelace. Shoelace, where are you? Shoelace. I'm stood in the middle of the park. Thanks, Sylvia. That was great. The other dog owners. They'd hear me shouting for shoelace, then look at each other in bewilderment. Sylvia, you know what to do. They say what? That battered hound is called shoelace. What is shoe name for a dog? Shoelace is not a dog's name. You should not be calling your dog shoelace. Your shoelace is called shoelace. That's why you call your shoelace shoelace, not your dog. But dog shoes are dog's name. Like Esther, or Rory, or Judy, or Kenneth, but not Shoelace. Shoelace is not a dust there. But you see, they don't know what Shoelace and I know. Shoelace is a dog's name, it's Shoelace's name, and there are very few dogs called Shoelace. And besides, Sylvia, give us a B flat Lydian scale. What two, three, four, now. The shoelaces on your shoes, well, they don't exercise in the park, 
So when I shout out shoelace, Sylvia underneath the play E flat Lydian scale, one, two, three, four, now. There's only shoelace that comes running, Sylvia. Extend the range of the B flat scale, one, two, three, now. And with all this spare time that Shoelace and I have not getting mixed up with all the other dogs, not called Shoelace, Sylvia, stretch out the E flat, what to now? Well, we can study Shoelaces together, just to prove how different Shoelace really is. And stop. We'd grow old together, Shoelace and I. Sylvia, take it to a flat major, half time. One, two, three, four, now. And when it comes for shoelace, Sylvia, augment it. One, two, now. To shuffle off this mortal coil, I'd make shoelace, Sylvia, 2E7, now. A shoelace shaped coffin, and throw shoelace, C sharp minor, now. A shoelace themed way, B major, now. With all the friends that shoelace made at the park. C stab to G7, now. When shoelace run off, and when A minor jab to B flat, now. And when shoelace got lost, take it to E major, now. Celebrate shoelace's life, as shoelace take it to you and diminish now. Shoelace passes through into shoelace heaven, down to D minor, now. Where shoelace could hang out with all the other dogs called shoelace, F sharp diminished, now. Though there are very few dogs with that name. 2F7, now. But Shoelace wouldn't mind, Sylvia wants more for luck. Because Shoelace enjoys Shoelace's own company, and I would have enjoyed the company of my dog, called Shoelace. A, C, D, C. My name is Sylvia Lucas and I'm a pianist from Manchester. I'm finishing my PhD at the moment. Two more months and I'll be done. Um, and my research actually focuses on the notation of the electronic track, not so much on the notation of the actual music I'm playing. Um, and basically I started uh, this research because as I performing these pieces was actually very hard for me at times. I didn't know whether to rely on what I was looking at in the score or to just time it. So basically I didn't know whether I was the only one asking this question. And I got this quote from composer Marco Stropa, which actually received a little bit my problems as a performer, not knowing how to synchronize. Um, so yeah, well that's the, the quote there. Basically, so uh, when I started my research, I had many questions, but these are the two that remain actually valid. Uh, so the first one, how do different approaches of notation of electronic sounds in conjunction with solo instruments inspire effective performance? And how can my research in notation and performance practice contribute to the creation of new works using electronics by collaborating with composers? So in order to answer the first question, I researched the already established repertoire for piano and electronics uh, from which I've got a very big chart that will be published with my doctoral thesis in two months' time. Um, and basically, when analysing them, all of them, I realised that there were three main approaches to annotation of these works. Um, so these three approaches are basically... Um, <laughs> it's not part of it. 
<laughs> oh, there we go. Um, so, very logical. We've got pieces that present really precise notation, really descriptive, descriptively. Uh, they represent the sounds that I'm hearing at the time that I'm hearing them. Uh, this is not to say that it's only notations. Um, they can be done in music, text, um, graphical, can be time indications, but basically all the information that I should need is there for me. Um, hybrid, so sometimes it's really good, sometimes I'm lacking some representation, or imprecise, or no representation at all. For me, when I started, actually, I thought that that would be the worst, um, but we'll see. Um, today I'm going to talk about two case studies of the extreme category. So this is very precise notation and lack or absen absence of notation. Um, so I'm going to start with absence of notation, which is the case of Luigi Nono. Um, this piece was one of the first pieces written for piano and electronics and was actually a collaboration between Mauricio Polini and Luigi Nono. Uh, the score that I have uh, in here, there is nothing for me that represents anything that I'm hearing apart from seven riferimentos al nastro, which are pickup points, and they have a few time indications. They're very, very spaced out. Um, so basically, when I started my research, I said, should I play this piece or not? And actually, it provided me with a blank canvas for investigation. I need to know how important it is for me to have notation. It might be that we don't need notation and that's it. Um, so basically I analyzed this from the per performance perspective. Um, how do I keep on time? I don't know what's happening. Well, um, I have to analyze the metronome marks in order to be on time. There are lots of uh, metronome marks. Those are all the changes that I've got throughout the piece. Um, <coughs> I tried to average them, I tried many things, um, but actually, um, the first thing, well, I wanted to be as metronomical as possible. In this slide, I didn't, I didn't, I forgot to include the word circa. All of these notations, all of these um, metronome notations actually have the word circa, because we're human. We're not gonna keep on time. Doesn't matter how hard we try, we're not machines. So, they're all circa, so I thought, well, actually, I might be able to relax a little bit after practicing loads with a metronome. Um, and yeah, how do I know when I'm playing crochet 40 or crochet 66? Sometimes this um, metronome marks are stretching. So I might start with 60 and then down to 44. The approach that I take here is a musical approach. Th that's a phrase there. Starts from the beginning and actually it just stretches and dies away towards the end. So for me, the, the best approach is the musical approach rather than the metronomical triplets, quintuplets approach. Um, then after having this work done, I wanted to find as many sonic, la sonic landmarks as possible. There are two very good ones here. In example one, that's an interlude actually. It's not notated anywhere, but I have to stop for a considerable amount of time. And in example two, it's actually something very pretty. Those G sharps, they blend beautifully with what I'm playing. So if I am playing at the same time, I'm good. Um, there are also lots of formatas. We've got square formatas and round formatas. Um, two different ways of interpreting this. Usually long formatas, the square ones, I need to stop for a considerable, of, a considerable amount of time. That is for me as well in order to synchronize and see where I am. And then I've got the other ones, the small ones, that actually they represent phrasing and they also represent a, a kind of written rubato. So it's a little bit inaccurate. It's beyond that time, but we can stop a little bit. Um, a lot of people perform with timers. I don't, as you see, 
that's my personal preference and I've spoken to many pianists that have performance piece and most of them were surprised that I wasn't doing that. I find that actually playing this piece orally gives a better palette of sound and color that I can that I can provide and, and at the same time I'm interacting with the electronics in a much um, human way. Also um, this piece called Soferti on the Serenade, it literally means suffering serene way. The rationale behind this piece it was written at a time of a lot of pain in both the lives of Luigi Nono and Maurizio Bellini. So I think I have to be lost a little bit in order to perform this piece. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it can be performed with, uh, with timer, but if, it's, if anybody does that, I would say find an app that you can coordinate with the main desk because if you start your timer and the engineer starts the timer, it might not be at the same time, so please do that. Just be at the same time, have a screen, know what's happening. Um, and then this is some sort of research on <coughs> prior research to mine on the performance of it. This is what I tried to aim. I've listened to Maurizio Bellini's performance, but it's not what I'm aiming for. I'm aiming to perform in my own way and I would invite everybody to perform in their own way, just the same way I do. Uh, so moving on to very precise notation. So this is a, a piece commis commissioned for my research, as I've said, by John Oren. And I didn't ask for any, and I did ask for notation, but I didn't ask for any particular approach. It's up to the composer. You can use the approach that suits the piece or yourself best. And actually, it ended up being very, very good. Um, very specific. Also very easy to notate. I mean, we're talking in English. We're notating words. So it's actually the, the best representation possible. Um, I also have to say that the spacing of, word, of words is impeccable. Um, not just the one, two, three, which is exactly at the same time, but every time that there is a um, rhythm written, that is actually where my eye is looking in the score. So it's it's really, mm, really specific. Um, now, how do I keep on time with this piece? I don't know whether you noticed, I was actually using a click track. I'm not meant to. This is another experiment for my research. Sorry to, to make you <laughs> witness it. Um, yeah, when I performed, when I premiered this piece, actually, I was out of sync in this bus. Actually, it wasn't noticed by the, by the audience. It was more to do with the acoustics of the room, but I was out of sync in bar 25 to 26, bar 53, bars 57, 61, 71, 77, 96, 119, 124, and 137. That's a lot. And I don't like being out of time, especially when there is a click track. Um, now, the reason for this, because, um, John was very nice in his in his notation. Every time that there would be a Google inter interlude, I had the actual rhythm written in the score. So every time I, I would start, it would be brilliant, great, 100% in sync. But actually, moving on, as the as the section would continue, I would lose a lot of synchronicity. So I'm still researching about that one. Today, I actually, I think I was a bit more active. You can tell me if you thought I was out of sync as well, maybe later on or, or in the question. Um, and yeah, then there is another very important, um, oh, sorry, so there was another one. Um, there's another very important uh, point in this piece, which is the thea theatricality. I don't know whether you saw me today, but actually, um, I was trying to give the impression that I was just following instructions. I didn't know what was gonna happen. Um, for that, it's very important for me to not not count out loud or, or give the impression to the audience that I'm counting. Um, I actually try to do this in all my pieces. I think it is good enough for us to count on ourselves. We don't have to uh, bang our head uh, to let the audience the audience know that we're doing that. But that is my personal preference. So don't judge me on that one. Um, so yeah, I try to not accent the first beat of every bar apart from the ones that are actually marked. Um, not listen to the tape. Only when it said my name, I would listen to it. Uh, I just took this selfish persona for it, uh, but, but why would I care? 
I thought that maybe you should come over me, I was just there. Um, and yeah, uh, this piece looks very simple, however, it's got a um, complicated simplicity in it. It's very, very showing, and it's got a little bit of a Mozart approach. I would say this was one of the hardest pieces. I think it's because I'm playing C major chorus, and if I don't play C major, everybody would know. Um, but yeah, it should be very simple and almost infantile in a way. Um, so yeah, wrapping up, these are two examples, two case studies that are part of my research. Um, these two approaches to notation work well. However, uh, there are a couple of points that I would like to do uh, about each category. Uh, the lack of exhaustive notation uh, makes the player explore new ways of following the tape. Uh, in my opinion, it implies a certain degree of flexibility and, and there is more room for oral connections and tone connections. Uh, so for um, this style of piece and this kind of music, it will work really well. However, having said that, this is not to say that you can completely disregard tempo uh, and pulse and all these things. It always should be regarded. Uh, also, on the other hand, a very descriptive notation provokes a more rational approach, uh, especially with regards to the tempo and the pulse relations. Uh, it works very well in pieces that feature fast rhythms and demand extreme synchronization. Um, also, depending on the kind of notation, sometimes a uh, click track is not always necessary. That would have been the case if the, that was much more rhythmical, everything was described rhythmically throughout the whole piece. I don't think I would have needed the, the click track because I would have had the reassurance. Um, so yeah, these are the two examples. There is the middle example as well, but that will be another presentation altogether. <laughs> right, thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions or, or want to say anything, just go for it. Thanks. <laughs>
the performance, the way I perform remains of that historically performance, uh, informed performance that Polini would have done, or Polini does. Mm -hmm. still around. So, yeah, no, but I completely agree. I've played pieces with uh, live electronics and the, the, the problem with it or the, the, the research approach is completely different from a performance perspective. Uh, that could be some food for my postdoctoral studies if I ever decide to do that. Uh, for the time being, just think. <laughs> no one else? I wanted to ask about yeah. the um, bits of acting you did there, you know? Yeah. It, it wasn't a requirement from the composer, though. It's your interpretation, right? Where you react to... to um, the, to it was something that we both kind of planned together. Uh -huh. It is written that I should follow the instructions and I should look a little bit, not like a Muppet, but almost. Um, just kind of following and being silly in a way. Mm -hmm. um, we decided to do it that way, so it ended up being a bit more theatrical. Mm -hmm. Also works quite well in performance when I'm playing by memory and just walk in the room. and. Kind of a fan piece, it's like hearted. Um, yeah, so I suppose if he rewrites it or whatever, I think he, he might put that little thing like, try to be the theatrical. But at the same time, don't be OTT, over the top. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, just something that because we've spoken about it and everything was rehearsed, by the way. I don't improvise much. I'm not good at it. So, so yeah, everything was rehearsed with him and and yeah and and does it affect the the performance like the way you play w when you do it with with the with the character yes and without yes it changes? yes it changes um thank you for saying that actually i left it it was a point that i had to say ah, okay. um yeah no i it's a bit silly when i'm practicing but i actually practice with all the gestures mm -hmm. and so there was a bit of an experiment because i never had the audience on my back so i actually had to turn around because it was so timed as well. Um, it's not every day that I have to do it, but I have to do it, uh, have to rehearse it that way. Um, the choreography of mm -hmm, it, yeah. Mm I particularly don't like it. It's also a highly detailed score. Yeah. Um, every note has a different articulation mark. 99% of them. I cannot say every single one. Um, so it's highly detailed, highly polyphonic as well. Uh, so I have to almost treat it like a back fugue. I don't know if you could hear the voices, but that was my intention. Um, also, by the way, it's not click track, it's timer. Ah. It's just a stopwatch. Like, you could, you could use a watch or you could use a, you know, like, like the gym ones. No, no click track. It wouldn't work. There, there is no actual faults that I can follow. Um, so, yeah, I've compared my own recordings. I've seen recordings of one of my supervisors that is also, um, has also played it. Um, I don't know, for, for other people, my work. And I'm not here to judge other performances. I perform, I, I judge my own performances here. I think it's, um, it, it would be mo more fair for this, for this purpose. So for me, I prefer it this way. But if you want to go and play with the timer, I might love it. So, you know, I'm, I'm not here to say this is right and this is wrong because, because I don't know. But I prefer it. I, for the reasons I said as well, for the phrasing and more natural and more tonal, No more questions? Well, I think that's it then. Thank you very much for the Thanks for having presentation me. and especially the performance. And well. thank you for the sound engineer. He was amazing. <laughs> 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 Actually have
have five minutes of a small break <laughs> before we can continue with Canon Edge. From time to time. Welcome for our last presentation, which is your performer of the day. Um, we have Kenneth Edge from the Royal Irish Academy of Music, who will guide us through some specific Irish music for saxophone. Thank you. 
very much. Um, so today, I'm just going to, I'm going to talk a little bit and I'm going to play the saxophone a little bit. It's kind of fundamentally what I'm going to do. And also just give a little kind of, a little roadmap through the research that I'm kind of currently involved in, in the Academy of Music in Dublin. The title of which is that. Okay. So, presenting a conference paper is a novel experience for me. My natural habitat or my comfort zone is that of the performing musician. Happy enough to talk before a performance, but as Sylvia said, pretty uncomfortable talking after a performance or talking more than a performance, <laughs> which is all of which I'm doing today. Um, so today I'm here as an artistic researcher with one foot sort of in the art world and the other foot in academia. And I've now entered third year in my doctoral thesis. I had it as second year there earlier, so I <laughs> scribbled that out. I'm just begun third year. Um, and not having really had a handle on what I was doing when I started, the one thing that has become very clear to me is that the really kind of exciting outcome of artistic research or what it can be is if knowledge is produced in the world of the performer and also in the kind of world of the more theoretical side of things and if um, it's useful to both of those worlds at the same time. So that's what I'm trying to achieve somewhat. So my research examines the processes involved in the preparation for performance and recording of uh, selected works for saxophone by Irish composers. My thesis includes extensive multimedia documentation of the cognitive embodiment of this repertoire. Along the way, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be talking about issues of technique, interpretation, notation, deliberate practice, expert performance, collaboration, rehearsal thought, memory, and the aging brain. Um, as part of the thesis, there'll be live public performances of all the works, uh, and they'll be recorded as audios, uh, CDs, and as videos or DVDs. And I hope that that will have some sort of significance other than being a sort of artifact of the research. So, so far, but by no means definitively, the compositions I'm including in my research are the following pieces. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. Could I just ask something? If the, if this, if the picture goes, oh wait, no. I wonder mm. will the sound keep going? I have sound in it. Oh. In some of the not not in this, but in some of the slides, there's sound as well. But if the picture goes, will the sound keep going? Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. great. That's okay. Cover every. Um, so, the scores of all these pieces are published by Ireland's Contemporary Music Centre, which is located in Dublin, in Ireland, on Fishamble Street, which was the site of the world premiere of Handel's Messiah in 1742. So this national repository of living music houses over 200 pieces featuring my instrument, the saxophone, as a solo instrument. So I'm going to play something now. It's only unforgiving acoustic in here for a wind instrument, I suspect. Um, I'm going to play one of these pieces now, and it's... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me there's a dodgy cable. I think it is a dodgy cable. Yeah. I'll come back in now. <coughs> I don't need to look at that to tell you what I'm going to play. <laughs> I'm going to play a piece by Michael McGlynn, who's an Irish composer. And the name of his piece is From Nowhere to Nowhere. It's a lovely title, and it has a kind of story attached to it, which I'll tell you. So Michael, oh, we're back, we're back. Michael is an Irish composer, and he's the founder director of uh, the famous vocal group Anuna. He composed From Nowhere to Nowhere in 1995, and it's scored for solo alto saxophone. Its title is inspired by a tragically failed famine relief scheme adopted in 1846 by the Irish Board of Works. This scheme put starving people to work, uh, mostly in the rural west of Ireland, building roads in order to supply them with a wage that they could live on. 
Uh, sadly, the wages paid for this work were wholly inadequate in stemming the <coughs> tide of starvation and emigration. Many of these roads are still there in Ireland, uh, unfinished, just in the middle of fields, mostly in the west of Ireland and leading from nowhere to nowhere. So I think this piece somewhat captures that. Very strange talking so much and then playing for minutes. she molds in it for which kind of defines the oral the sound of it most of it um okay i recorded that piece back in 1996 which i it's quite a long time ago um and its inclusion in this research in the in the project kind of it reflects a desire i have to revisit a lot of pieces that i played when i was younger which also ties into some of the aging brain um uh, things i'm looking at so um, I suppose just this, the eight, that the, the interpretation thing is, of course, thoroughly subjective. Um, and one of my questions is, how can we, if it's that subjective, if it's that embodied, how can we gain, how can we turn it into knowledge? How can we express it in a way other than actually playing it? Um, so, oh, we're still still. Uh, how do we produce this knowledge? The title of the essay this quote is taken from uh, is called Thinking Through Music. It's a paraphrase of the painter Paul Ce uh, <coughs> excuse me, Cezanne's comment that the painter thinks in painting, with its implication that artistic creation is by its very nature beyond words or description. In these three knowledge domains, artistic, embodied, and discursive, the artistic refers to the output, the artwork itself, the performance, the embodied refers to the non-intellectual, tacit, intuitive skills of a performer, while the discursive is the domain into which we'd somehow like to translate this knowledge so we can investigate and discuss it and use it. In his, oh, <laughs> in his book, Intelligence in the Flesh, I'll try and get that working. Um, it's a wonderful book, Intelligence in the Flesh. Uh, it's by a British cognitive psychologist called uh, Guy Claxton. He quotes a Hungarian-British polymath, Michael Kolyani's lyrical description of what tacit knowledge is. Right? And I just included it because I think it's lovely, it's very poetic. 
So it's knowledge that is such a fine web of contingent possibilities. The neurochemical loops and networks that underpin your expertise are orders of magnitude more intricate than any vocabulary, however technical, could hope to capture. It's not that you are inarticulate. The knowledge itself is of such delicacy that is in principle inarticulable. It's a great word, inarticulable, I have to say. So Claxton, he's speaking of neurochemical loops and networks underpinning expertise. Expertise in performance is itself a fully fledged kind of scientific discipline, having its roots in the work of Swedish psychologist K. Anders Ericsson, most notably, mo notably in an article written with Ralph Crump and Clemens Tesh Romer in 1993 for the journal Psychological Review. Uh, Anders Ericsson, the author of this article, has conducted interviews and studied with leading practitioners in the fields of sport, medicine, music, chess, and fine arts, amongst other kind of disciplines. He cites many statistics cataloging extraordinary increases in human capacity through deliberate practice. He postulates that if one can explain how elite performers have attained such levels of achievement, this knowledge could benefit people hoping to maximise their performance levels in any chosen field. I will try to fix this as well as you. Okay, brilliant. I'm going to hang on because there's a bit of a, there's a visual gag coming up, <laughs> I would believe. Um, <laughs> I'm waiting for the big old guy. <laughs> okay. Oh no, you're okay. No, it's fine. Um, this deliberate practice thing is kind of interesting. And Anders Ericsson, um, he came up with a figure, uh, an amount of hours that he imagines, of course, is the minimum you can you you can invest in what you're doing to attain mastery of your chosen thing. And that number, of course, is. I was going to press the button here, <laughs> and it's going to say 10,000 hours. <laughs> so 10,000 hours, you can visualize it. Um, oh well. yeah. <laughs> so 10,000 hours. This is the first appearance, actually, of the 10,000 hours to master something catchphrase brought into the popular culture by Malcolm Gladwell in his best-selling book of 2008, Outliers. Anders Ericsson's contention that deliberate practice over a prolonged period is more relevant than innate talent in achieving mastery is a highly contested, of course, claim. Intuitively, we feel that, well, I feel that's maybe not exactly right. But studies have been conducted um, that there are people who become expert in their speciality in way less time, and there's people who never become expert at all, regardless of the amount of hours they would invest in deliberate practice. Of course, elite artistic performance or creation, unlike sporting achievement, is subjective and pretty unquantifiable, if not totally unquantifiable. So what is Anders Ericsson's idea of deliberate practice, because this kind of applies, I think, uh, and how does it differ from just normal, regular practice? He describes it as this. So engagement in highly structured activities. So these activities are kind of created to improve performance in a domain through immediate feedback from a teacher or coach. That's kind of an essential part of deliberate practice, the immediate feedback. Um, it requires a high level of concentration. And he reckons this is best sustained, of course, in short sessions of highly intense work. Anders Ericsson curiously states that these sessions are not inherently enjoyable. <laughs> which I think we kind of know. <laughs> but studies, it's great to have studies approved these things. Okay, it's not aimed at a vague improvement in overall performance, but it's goal-specific. This probably, a lot of this applies, well, uh, applies to us learning music, applies to uh, sport very much so. Um, it, in, it aims at improving mental representations. Now, these mental rep representations are kind of visualising what you're going to do before you do it. Uh, like mental practice, you know, if you're, you can practice away from it. If you're an instrumentalist, you can 
look at a piece of music and practice it without having any tactile sort of involvement. And it has been proven that that works. Um, okay, and the final thing is it must continuously move the student just beyond the edge of their current abilities. Okay. Anders Ericsson's writing on expertise both complement and contradict the work of the Croatian psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who coined the term flow to describe what we all know as performers as kind of being in the zone. Um, these descriptions of flow exhibit certain similarities to Anders Ericsson's deliberate practice model. However, the main difference in perspective is a stark one, I think. Indeed, the flow model is viewed that the experience of rehearsal activity is intrinsically rewarding, such that often the end goal is just an excuse for the process. Could not be further removed from Anders Ericsson's goal-specific repetitive practice, which may or may not be enjoyable. <laughs> Here's a pleasing graphic, uh, kind of representation of flow. Kind of states it very clearly, what yeah. Cheek sent me high has in mind. Um, we see from this graph that in order to stay in flow, we must constantly match our skills to appropriate challenges. As we overcome these challenges, our skill levels increase, and we must therefore increase the challenges in order to stay within flow. So like deliberate practice, the flow model is concerned with the continuous and gradual improvement of skills. Now, uh, although my research, the focus of my, my instrument is the saxophone course, I'd like to briefly discuss an essay I wrote in 2017, which acted for me as a kind of stepping stone into the research I'm doing now. This es essay it documents me learning to play one of my own pieces. This sounds a bit curious, but I I'll explain what it means. Um, and the name of that piece is Wait a While. It should be up now. Okay. I composed this piece in 2015 for the extraordinary Irish clarinetist Paul Rowe. And as well as being a saxophonist, I played the clarinet also, but very, very, very much as a secondary instrument. Um, I've never had formal clarinet lessons, but I do have a good knowledge, I think, of its tonal and sort of technical possibilities without being able to you know, do it myself. So I had a composer's mental construct of wait a while, but as a performer, I had no embodied concept of this work. I composed the piece away from any tactile involvement with the clarinet, as I didn't want it to be defined by my own clarinet playing idiosyncrasies, of which there are many. Oh. Spoiled again. Wow. No, it's okay. <laughs> of which there are many. I'll anyway, <laughs> today, uh, Paul has played this piece a lot of times around the world, actually, and I'm delighted he enjoys playing it. Because of its, kind of, it's, it, its highly virtuosic and showy nature, the piece has become popular with Paul's pupils, one of whom is here, I see Marcel is there, um, who have programmed it in recitals and competitions and degree uh, recitals also. Um, now, while I was rehearsing this piece with the performers and stuff, I found, uh, I developed a sense of frustration that I wasn't able to express by playing what I wanted to convey. I, 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 was, I had to go back to words um, okay. uh, yeah, I couldn't demonstrate my thoughts on this. I didn't even try to demonstrate my thoughts on the clarinet. Um, but I found myself saying really sort of silly things. Like sort of, here, I mean, is there any way that could sound like a banshee? Banshee is an Irish witch, and mm -hmm. it's famous for howling and screaming. And using words like that to convey to performer what you would like is completely and utterly useless to them. Uh, and to me, but this frustration, I don't know if that's back on. Or not. It's there in the right hand corner, yeah. Left hand. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll try it now. But what I decided to do is I decided to set myself the challenge of learning to play this piece on the clarinet. Um, and just to apply some of these deliberate practice and flow concepts of things, of repetitive, you know, all of these things that I've shown, and see if I could do it, or not even see if I could do it, just see what the learning process would be like. So over a two week period I did this and I used audio recordings as a way of documenting the embodiment of the piece. I used music technology as a rehearsal aid. I recorded the works piano part into the software program Logic Pro. 
And this piano recording acted as an extremely useful advanced metronome for some of the sections with more com complex rhythmic structures and time signatures. I recorded all the clarinet se rehearsal sessions onto a small device like a Zoom, I think it was, and I spliced together a sort of overview of two weeks of me trying to learn something and just to see what the process was like and, and just to listen to myself learning or trying to learn something. Um, as I say, the, the learning really wasn't, or the learning was the most important thing. Um, I have a, oh here, I can play a bit of audio. It's a little bit rough now because it was just done on a Zoom in, in, a, in an office at home. But I put it together and towards the end of it, you kind of hear that I got it together a, a bit. <laughs> anyway, it's from the very start, very start of learning it too. Would that be okay? Yeah. I have a lot of audio actually. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. So I'll tell you what it sounded like. <laughs> <laughs> um, it kind of began very slowly and tentatively, and just using metronome and really reverting to basics and finding out the things I absolutely found troublesome and difficult to do on the clarinet. And over a period of the two weeks. It came together quite well, I think. Not 100% as I'd like it, but, but quite well. I have two minutes of clip of, a, of, of, of the advancement from novice to sort of being able to play it, but I don't know why it's not working. Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, okay. Oh. Yeah. Spoiled by technology. Yeah, that's true. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> This was going to the studio project. Yeah. I think it's just close to one last time. Can I do it there? Yeah, and this too. This might be it. To bar 245. <laughs> around and around. Very novice, but. Thank you. 
really, but also just as an examination of embodying something like that. I can see, I could see listening through the things. I could almost hear kind of a click when something went past the kind of the uh, the mind into the hands and into the body. Um, anyway, it's not perfect, but that wasn't the point. It was just a, the learning curve. Uh, during this, a question I considered was: Is a composer's vision of his or own or her own work necessarily the blueprint? on which future generations of performers should have should base their interpretation. Opinions differ on this, but I tend to agree with Pierre Boulez when he says the truth of any interpretation is essentially transitory. I undertook this clarinet project to examine the learning process. In truth, that's kind of the academic, academic in me speaking. The performer, I really did want to learn to play it because I'm a performer, all performers want to perform. I wanted to play it and see if I could play it accurately um, while the academic in me I was writing about an expansion of the auto-ethnographic model of the performer and researcher being the same person to that of the performer, researcher and composer being the same person the performer in me meanwhile was having a whale of a time trying to learn this and trying to record it and playing with microphones and playing with clarinets and things so these two different cells within us this unification of two distinct selves in creating something new it's for me uh, a good definition of what artistic research is or should be um, I know there's many different interpretations of what artistic research is but my own particular thing is like the sort of the performer and the sort of academic but creating something new together as a unified kind of thing um, this kind of metacognitive approach to, to learning and to the embodiment process has directly kind of influenced how I think about playing the saxophone also, which is a good thing. Uh, now, I don't know if there's, there's one more piece with audio, but I'm not, I, I'll give it a go, I'll it give it a go. Work. It'll work, okay. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm gonna just finish up by playing a bit of music now. I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> yeah. This is better, cue. Mm -hmm. Now, two little pieces I'm just going to finish up with. Now, my own piece here, from time to time, it's in its very, very, very embryonic stage of development and it'll more than likely travel in various different directions which I'm not yet aware of. So far, the work has two points of departure. Um, the first of these departure points is the wonderful uh, music thing which is called music minus one i don't know if you've heard of this music minus one is a magnificent company founded in new york in 1950 predating the advent of karaoke the music minus one label supplies a full recording say of rachmaninoff's second piano concerto with fritz reiner and the phil philadelphia orchestra and it also supplies a full recording without the soloist so you can become the soloist <laughs> um that's why it's called Music Minus, when you slot in. So far, it has a catalogue of a thousand recordings, almost a thousand recordings, Music Minus One, mostly in the classical and jazz genres. Um, so, and the, this Music Minus One phenomenon represents one of the great early innovative, innovative uses of modern technology. My own Music Minus One experience is a play-along recording of Stravinsky's Soldier's Tale with the clarinetist removed. <laughs> Although it is highly enjoyable for me to become a temporary member of the Parnassus Ensemble of New York in the 1975 recording, it's always struck me as a kind of odd and strange and somewhat spooky um, thing to do. Partly because you can actually still hear the clarinetist somewhere in the background playing because the, all the mics bled into each other. And they say on the thing, it's just a, some beautiful writing about it, you know, a sonic remnants of the clarinet is mm. maybe audible. Uh, I love those words. Um, and the first point of departure. The second point of departure is um, a visit by the Genoese fabulous violinist Niccolo Paganini to Dublin in 1831, where he performed at the Theatre Royal in Dublin and then travelled around Ireland in a horse and cart and uh, performing 23 more concerts. And why this piqued my imagination is, well, I'm from Dublin, and I hadn't known that Paganini had come to Dublin, but Franz Liszt had visited Ireland many times, of course. And it's so hard to find out anything, research any of this thing about Paganini. There's a huge amount 
about him traveling around England and Scotland. Um, but nothing that I could find about Ireland, apart from some very dodgy references written in history books around the time. So that kind of piqued my imagination. Uh, let me see. The third section of the piece is called What Makes You Happy? And that, for that bit of the piece, I just went around Dublin asking people what makes them happy, which is a little bit odd. <laughs> but, uh, I'd never done anything like that, so you'll hear that. I just thought it was nice in this day and age when nobody, you know, things aren't that positive. Uh, just uh, ask for the first reaction, and I have a few of those. Some of them are lovely, some of them are a bit odd. <laughs> um, so, and the funny thing is, I'm not really going to play anything in this. I play a little bit of saxophone here and there, but I don't do anything else. The sc the, I speak. The work, if I can find the words, the work, it's scored for alto saxophone, soprano saxophone, bowron, which was uh, an Irish kind of frame drum, which you'll hear. Where is it? Um, what else is in it? Piano, play a bit of piano. The voices of the people on the streets are part of it. The sound of rain in Dublin is part of it. The sounds of the beach in a place called Par Port Marnock, which is one of my, where I grew up, is in it. All of these, I, I, in a way, it just kind of come, it, it has come out as a slight love letter to Dublin. Um, so I'll try it now. As I say, I'm just mostly speaking in this. I don't know how that happened, because most of the music I've written has been, you know, music. But I've just written words here. So we we'll see how it goes. Now, hopefully. From time to time. From time to time, a sonic shadow of the removed instrumentalist may be audible. Remove the clarinetist. If we could get the hang of it entirely, it would take far too long. Please choose the instrumental line you would like to perform. find our happiness entirely in somebody else's time. He likes to feel as though he is a part of something. is to be believed, all the regular mundane problems of intonation, consistency of tone and technical fluency are now fully resolved. Sure the f***ing thing plays itself. Fully resolved. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
now um, by playing a piece by John Buckley, who's a renowned Irish composer, and he comes from a beautiful part of Ireland, um, in County Limerick, it is County Limerick, not Tipperary, a place called Temple Glanton, which is actually picture postcard beautiful. John was born in 1950, and he composed this piece, Arabesque, in 1995. 1990, sorry, God. Okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you.